I'm very happy and very proud and very glad uh, to have Professor Piero Capelli back with us. Uh, hardly needs any introduction. Piero was a fellow here at the center. Uh, all of you who work at the center in the workspace know Piero because he was a constant there for a while. Um, and I think uh, uh, to everyone's uh, mutual uh, uh, benefit, uh, Professor Piero Capelli is an associate professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at the University of Venice and the editor in chief of the journal Chanoch, Chanoch, Historical and Textual Studies in Ancient and Medieval Judaism and Christianity. His research focuses on the history of texts and ideas in Judaism from late antiquity to the Middle Ages and on medieval Jewish Christian polemics, on which a topic on which he published extensively. Uh, and I, I know his work for, for a while. I mean, we've been in touch for, for I think, more than, a, more than a decade. You're right. More than a decade. Or so. Uh, or so. Um, and his topic for today is written on the board, Converts in Anti-Jewish Polemics in the 13th Century. Piero, the question. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Haim. Thanks, I think. Thanks, uh, uh, everyone. I, I have to circumscribe my title, as you see behind my back, to uh, into converts in anti-Jewish polemics in the 13th century, which has been my uh, favorite research topic for some years now. Uh, some of the most influential figures in Christian anti-Jewish polemics of the late Middle Ages have been investigated in detail from the perspective of their, of their intellectual biographies and even of their psychological profiles. This is the case, for instance, with Peter the Venerable, with Gilbert of Nogent, with Rupert of Deutz, with Herman of Calhoun. Last year we listened to, we, we attended a, 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 an extremely interesting seminar by Jean-Claude Schmitt about that, and Avner of Burgos. And let me be so vain as to add my, a recent essay of mine about Nicholas Donin, about whom I'm going to talk today too. The works of some other converts, or the sources on which similar research can be conducted, are available in research and methodologically up-to-date critical editions. This is the case, again, for Peter Alfonsi, for Guillaume of, Guillaume of Bourges, again for Abner of Burgos. But still others have not yet been the object of adequate research from either perspective. This, for instance, is the case with the converts Paul Cristiani, the Christian contestant in the public disputation held in Barcelona against Moses Nachmanides in 1263, um, who has not yet been fully analyzed from the perspective of what David Malkiel calls the so the, his social and cultural intimacy with both his new religion and the rabbinical tradition he criticized. The same can be said about a contemporary of Paul Christianis from southern Italy, specifically from Trani in Apulia, 40 odd kilometers northwest of Bari along the Adriatic shore, whose name was Manuforte and about whom we have very scanty but also very interesting biographical information that we'll try to briefly assess today. In my attempt at a better understanding of the figures of Cristiani and Manuforte, I have to resort to their slightly older contemporary and my old friend, Nicholas Donin, the convert who triggered the so-called Paris trial of 1240 against the Talmud. On June 1240, if we are in Paris, if we are to trust the Hebrew literary account of the events, the Babylonian Talmud was put on trial before a jury of bishops, other clerics, and university scholars commissioned by Pope Gregory IX at the behest of the convert Nicholas Donin and convened by King Louis IX. The jury and judges found the Talmud guilty of several of the charges leveled against it, and after a delay of one or two years, the king implemented the sentence with the burning of a huge number of copies of the Talmud in the main square in Paris. Some of the historical questions surrounding the Paris trial are still wanting deeper understanding. I will focus <coughs> briefly, I hope, on the role played by Nicholas Donin, not only in the trial itself, but in the other events of his time, particularly the struggles between the church and the states. The decade between 1235 and uh, 1245 marked a turning point in the web of relationships between the church and the Jews, among Jews themselves, between the church and the various states of Europe, and between each of those states and the Jews. Following a case of blood libel in Fulda in 1235, the German Emperor Frederick II granted the Jews 
the protected status of Servi Camere Nostre, Servi Camere Regie, that is serfs of the serfs of the imperial treasury. So that in theory anyone who caused them harm caused harm to the emperor himself. In France, however, the local barons exerted constant financial pressure on the Jews. Uh, particularly when the lords grew severely indebted from answering the call to the Crusades. And the attendant hostility culminated in 1306 in Philip the Fair's expulsion of the Jews. In Aragon, during the expansion of the kingdom under, under James I, the monarchy granted the Jews some protection and privilege, while at the same time promoting the mendicant orders missionary missionizing activity, including forced attendance at Christian preaching. These new relationships had both theological and institutional consequences. Through the activity of the friars of the new mendicant orders, the church turned with new aggressiveness toward non-conformists, were they cathars, heretics or Jews, but it would not have done so without competition with the states and could not have done so without the state's help. A series of events during this nearly two decade period reconfigured the relationship among church, state and Jews. You see the list, you can go through the list of events behind my back with your eyes. Now it is of fundamental importance for the history of Jewish-Christian relations in the Middle Ages at large that Nicholas Donin had a role in almost every single one of the events listed. Who was Nicholas Donin? According to the, uh, well, you uh, um, probably all of you attend, or most of you attended the, the um, seminar in last February about the Latin Talmud here at the center. So you all know that the Latin Christian materials about the Paris Kere, uh, the Paris affair of the Talmud in 1240, are contained in a group, a bunch of manuscripts. Uh, the most important of uh, whom is Latin 16558 of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So uh, one of the sources collected in this dossier, in this manuscript, tells us that Donin was born in La Rochelle that he was of purportedly immense erudition in Hebrew, even according to the testimony of the Jews themselves. In the Hebrew account of the purported trial of 1240, the Vikuach Rabenu the Jewish contestant, Rabbi Yechiel of Paris, mentions twice the fact that Donin was expelled or estranged from the Jewish community already in 1225, or rather had walked out of the Jewish community. So this is, I take the information that you can read behind my back, uh, with the, the, the most relevant parts in bold. I take it from the uh, Paris manuscript, the, there are two main manuscripts of this text, uh, one in Paris and one in Moscow. Both manuscript, uh, manuscripts actually give the same kind of information about Donin. They are very different from each other, but in this case they, they are coincident. So our Latin source, the one in Paris, says that Donin was baptized only 11 years later, in 1236. If this is true, Don, uh, Donin's criticism of Judaism, of rabbinical Judaism, preceded his conversion to Christianity. We cannot confidently say the same about other converts who engaged in the anti-Talmudic polemics, such as Peter Alfonsi, the author of the influential Dialogue Against the Jews, written at the be very beginning of the 12th century, which was one of the sources for Donin's polemical arguments. In sum, Donin was critical of rabbinic texts long before he criticized them on behalf of the church. Not in every case did anti-Talmudic criticism imply straightforward conversion to Christianity. Another source for Donin's biography is the letter of one Yaakov ben Elia to Paul Christiani, a letter that Robert Chazen believes was written in Spain shortly before the disputation in Barcelona. Uh, in this letter we are told Donin is called the apostate who became a convert from the laws of, of God and his Torah and did not even believe in the Roman religion. Um, uh, we, we see the Hebrew uh, um, a little later. Omissis, this apostate went before the king superior to all kings 
um, in name and honor and spoke lies and made false accusations that on Passover nights we slaughter young boys and, and stuff. The honored king in his piety and cleanness of hands did not believe his words and paid no heed to him. <coughs> Solomon Grazel had convincingly, in, in my opinion, convincingly proposed that the, what is being discussed here is the Council of Hagenau and Augsburg that fall, and the investigation that followed the uh, Fulda blood libel case of 1235, and that the king was therefore Frederick II, to whom Donin spoke the blood libel. It is debated, though, whether Yakov's accusation that, that Donin spoke the blood libel is reliable or not. The Vicuach provides a clue on the issue ex silencio, for it is uh, an extremely aggressive uh, text against Donin, who is the bad guy, the bad guy in the story. Um, still, um, there is no, no mention at all is made of the blood libel in the text, and it's to say the least, unlikely that such a polemical text would have missed an opportunity to target Donin for such an important issue. Nor is the blood libel mentioned in any of the sources, both Latin and Hebrew, directly related to the Talmud affair. There are other social sources to talk about, uh, but there's also a lot of other stuff. So let's turn to Donin's attack on rabbinic literature, its sources and its strategies. The best documented event in Donin's life career is, of course, the Talmud affair of 1240. The 35 charges he submitted to the Pope are listed in an appendix called the Articuli Literarum Pape, an appendix to the Extractiones de Talmud, the vast collection of passages from the Talmud translated into the Latin that you, you know, from this, that you will know. All the charges are supported with proof texts translated from the Talmud itself and from Rashi's commentaries to it. The oldest manuscript containing this dossier, not the only one, but the oldest one, is Paris, Latin, 16558, compiled soon after 1248. And the manuscript also contains, uh, I am really sorry to have forgotten to add one important piece of evidence contained in the manuscript. So after the uh, sorry, right between, in between the Extractiones de Talmud and the Articuli Literarum Pape, you should add uh, five uh, folios containing a collection of ridiculous, that is, the irrational, blasphemous, anti Christian, and pro rabbinic, pro Talmudic passages taken from collections called Krovot of liturgical hymns. Um, this collection, this anthology, has in the Latin sources the title De Libro Crubot, K-R-U-B-O-T. Sorry for forgetting to add it in the PowerPoint. Um, Wout van Beckum, um, I owe Wout van Beckum thanks because he allowed uh, me to see a very important essay of his on the De Libro Crubot, which is still awaiting publication. Is forthcoming in a miscellany. He says he has shown that most uh, of these hymns, the hymns included in this anthology, but not all of them, were taken from a Krova for the feast of for the holiday of Shavuot, mm -hmm. composed by a Norman Paitan of the 11th century, whose name was Benjamin Bashmuel of Coutances. There follows the uh, Ardonians articuli, then a dossier of glosses. Uh, um, of 160 additional glosses of Rashi on the Bible, the glosses Salomoni tre Salomonis Trecensis, other glosses of Rashi's to the Talmud are included in Donin's articuli and are part of the accusations leveled by Donin against the Talmud. So Talmud and the, the Bavli and Rashi's commentary to the, Bi to the Bavli are considered as one and the same, basically one of the same source material. And the last part is the two chancery abstracts of the responses given by the rabbis Yechiel of Paris, Vivo Meldensis, and Yehuda of Melun, Magister Judas, to the tribunal that asked them whether Donin's accusations were actually supported by the Talmud, and both rabbis apparently admitted to almost every article of the case for prosecution. 
all these different groups, including the, the, the Libro, uh, Liber Krubot, all these different groups of an anthologized rabbinic sources, share three broad typologies of accusation or of simple categorization. First, passages that are absurd or profane, that is, non-conforming to the standards of rationality that were becoming the new trend in European culture, including the realm of theology. Second, passages legitimating the doctrine of the dual Torah, rabbinic tradition, and their authoritativeness within Judaism. Third, passages insulting the Christians and their beliefs. Let's keep these categories in mind because they will turn useful to analyze our other converts of the day. Now, what happens of Donin after the Paris affair? The portrait of Donin that emerges from the, the whole bunch of the sources on the Paris affair is one of a convert who had embraced wholeheartedly the church's criticism of rabbinic authority and rabbinic literature, inclusive of both the Talmud and Rashi, to, and Rashi to both the Bible and the Talmud. And as we have seen, he seems to have done so even before his conversion to Christianity. The evidence about what happened, what, what became of Donin after the Paris trial, let's call it this way, is scanty. The last mention of him appears in the Hebrew account of the second disputation that was held in Paris in 1269, but no further biographical information is to be found there. We are just told that Paul Christiane, who was the Christian contestant in that disputation, reused part of the arguments of the apostate that preceded him, the one from Rabbi Yechiel's time, and that the, uh, the Jewish contestant, one Rabbi Avraham of Rouen, thought that the little finger of that apostate, Donin, was thicker than the groins of this one, who is not even worth a garlic skin, this is a quotation from Bavli Becharot, as in his life he never really knew anything. We cannot even state that Donin became a friar himself, as a long-standing tradition in modern secondary literature as maintained from the mid-19th century on. We can only infer a hint in this direction, not proper positive evidence, from one sentence in the Vikuach Rabbeinu Yechiel that his strength and his counsel consisted in the help of the Chovlim, of the Franciscan friars. Uh, whatever the case, Donin served along with the friars as one of the most important chess pieces in no fewer than two games developing on the chessboard of real politique in Europe at the time. Frederick II against Pope Gregory IX, if Donin was really involved with the investigation about the Fulda blood libel. And, second game, Louis IX versus the Council of Toulouse for supremacy in, southern, in what would soon become southern France. Frederick II used this protection of the Jews as a servi camere regis against papal incursions into his realm. Louis IX, for his part, used the Jews as sources of income and heretics, including Talmudic Jews, as a means of earning the Pope's support and the Dominicans' help in expanding into what would soon become southern France. For instance, in the uh, Great Inquisition of the Laura Gay in 1245, to, to which uh, Mark Pegg has devoted a very interesting book. Donin is thus the earliest well-documented example of how the Church, the Empire, and the rising national states exploited Jewish scholars, should I anachronistically say intellectuals, converted to Christianity in their policy of expanding their jurisdictions on the jurisdiction on the Jews. Donin's religious identity before convention, conversion, sorry does not neatly fit in any of the best-known rubrics of his age. In the Vikuach, Yehiel calls him simply Kofer divrei chachamim, one who ceased to believe, one who denied the words of the sages. Several scholars have claimed or suggested that he was a Karaite in generic intellectual inclination, if not in group adherence. Others are rightly more cautious, opposition to the Talmud is not enough to make one a Karaite. Further, there is no evidence of Karaite groups in northern France in the 13th century. Nor can we define Donin as a full-fledged, philosophically aware rationalist on the basis of his accusations against the Talmud. One element of philosophical rationalism clearly underlies at least one of 
one category of charges that he brought, that of absurdity, a charge that, for instance, included anthropomorphic, excessively anthropomorphic representation of God, Donin may well have taken from Peter Alfonsi, the criticism of the image of God wearing phylacteries in, in the, at the very beginning of the Bavli, in um, Berachot, Bavli Berachot 3a. But Donin does not articulate this rationalism in full-fledged philosophical arguments. He merely says that these things are absurd and that they offend reason. He was certainly influenced by rationalism and the fiery intellectual climate of the Maimonidean controversy in Provence, but only indirectly as far as our evidence enables us to conclude. We have no evidence that he ever spent any time in southern France, nor that he maintained connections with rationalist Jewish intellectuals in Sephardic and Provence, nor that he became a friar. More plausibly, though this is a point limited to the, to the intra-Jewish context, we can define Donin as someone who opposed classical rabbinical literature as the justification for contemporary rabbinic leadership. Milan Zonza has suggested a parallel between Donin's activity and the sola scriptura movements that were agitating the masses in Christian societies of the 12th and the 13th century, such as the, in the case of the Valdensians in Bourgogne. John Baldwin suggested personally to me another parallel with the aversion to patristic tradition as manifested in the 12th century by Peter the Cantor. Now, in accord, if we are to follow the Vikuach Rabbeinu Yechiel, Donin dated the reduction of the Talmud to 400 years ago, that's his own. If we are to take this uh, dating uh, precisely, um, it only appears in the Paris manuscript. In the other manuscripts, the question is much more complicated, and I have devoted an essay to this in the recent Festschrift for Günther Sternberger. But if we are to take seriously or to make sense of the dating of the Talmud to 400 years later, earlier, sorry, whereas Rabbi Yechiel counters that it, the Talmud was actually uh, 1500 years uh, older, that means that he dated it to the very beginning of what is, deemed, what is called the Shashelta Kabbalah in, in Masekat Avot of the Mishnah. 400 years makes sense if we consider Talia Fishman's hypothesis of uh, a dating based on the textualization of the Talmud into writing, that's Talia's expression, and therefore the institutionalization of rabbinic literature as a corpus for the teaching and the practice of traditional law, which Donin might have perceived as a treason against the oral origins of rabbinic lore throughout late antiquity and the high middle ages, and the Geonic era, of course. His charges against the Talmud would thus represent not only the Church's new awareness of the authority of the Talmud in Jewish life, therefore making the Jews not only the people of the book, but the people of two books, one of which, of course, had to be an heretic one, but also a new form and role that the Talmud as text, as written text, was acquiring among the Jews themselves. The last piece of information we get about Donin is taken from the Moscow man manuscript of the Bukuach that says in its opening about Donin's fate, he was eventually killed in his church. And Yaakov ben Elia in his Igeret apparently confirms uh, this, saying that he did not even believe in the religion of Rome, uh, uh, in Rome and that he was struck and died and no one avenged his blood. He wa we are thus granted important confirmation to the possibility that Donin was heterodox by the standards of Judaism and Christianity alike. In a brilliant essay on Jewish intellectuals converting to Christianity in the Middle Ages, Yossi Schwartz distinguishes between communities of knowledge and communities of discourse. A community of knowledge is the wider frame of communication and transmission of culture across boundaries and ages. And the while a community of discourse involves interpersonal communication within a circumscribed sociological context. The Jewish apostates of the Middle Ages, Donin among them in my opinion, 
created, I quote from Yossi, a new community of knowledge separated from all their former surroundings, yet at the same time they were involved in a variety of discourse, of discourse communities, one of which was the inner discursive circle they themselves had formed. One must then consider Donin's inner discursive circles both before and after his conversion. As for Donin's community of knowledge, I would suggest that, he, that it may be a mistake to class him under the same rubric as the Hispano-Provencal converts who preceded and followed him. Alfonsi, Cristiani, Abner of Burgos, Pablo de Santa Maria, and the like. Their intellectual roots were different, as were their polemical agendas, and Donin's philosophical and ex exegetical instruments were more circumscribed than theirs. In any case, it is certain that Donin belonged to a community of discourse distinct from the one of the Sephardic converts. His hometown, La, Ro La Rochelle in Poitou, for the entire 12th and 13th centuries was governed by a local aristocracy in perennial rebellion against distant rulers. First the Plantagenets, then the Capetians. Among these aristocrats was the Duke of Brittany, Pierre de Dreux, who for almost two decades had been conducting his own fight for suzerain rights, at times against his own vassals when they became excessively independent, at others against the bishops who had, uh, the bishops who had suzerainty over the Jews and therefore over the assets of Jewish moneylenders. In his oscillating politics, the Duke alternatively, alternately pursued help from the king against the bishops or help from the popes against the barons. One finds a similar convergence of aims and efforts, both political and military, in the moyen durée from 1215 to the 1250s between the church, which aimed at repressing the Albigensians, and the Capetian monarchy under Louis VIII and Louis IX, which aimed at expanding into the duchy of Toulouse and Provence. There is also another relevant parallel between Louis IX's politics towards Jews around the Paris affair, using them, that is, using them as a tool to please and accommodate the Pope's political theology, and their exploitation by Pierre de Dreux, and eventually by other suzerains and the Capetian king themselves, as a financial resource to fund participation in the crusade that Gregory IX had proclaimed in 1234 the crusade to which Pierre de Dreux adhered personally in 1236. It thus happened that in 1236, participants in the crusade massacred the Jews of Poitou, along with those of Anjou and Brittany. Pierre's son, Jean Leroux, eventually expelled, expelled the Jews from Brittany in April 1240, thus wiping out the huge debts his father and his vassals had incurred in order to fund their participation in the crusade. Donin's stance on the massacres of 1236 is reported in the Vikuach, if we are to trust, of course, the, the textual uh, literary evidence in Hebrew. The villain said, how many myriads of you fell by the sword in Brittany, Anjou, and Poitou? Where are the portents and the signs that your God wrought for you, if you, as you say, are the chosen people? One can even explain how Donin might have adopted such a position given the status and treatment of the Jews in the region from which he himself came. In the bull Lacrimabilem of September 1236, to all the bishops of northern and western France, Gregory IX admitted that his earlier bull Rachel Sum Videns of 1234 might have been misunderstood in that the Jews at home had been inadvertently subsumed into the same category of the enemies of Christ that the Pope says he had meant to define only the Saracens abroad. So in the Lacrimabilem, Gregory graphically describes the massacres, quantifies the loss of Jewish life as 2,500, and mentions in passing the first securely uh, uh, attested burning of Jewish books by Christian hands in medieval history. Such then was the condition of the Jews in northern and western France, from where Donin came, on the eve of the Paris affair 
and of Donin's participation to it. <coughs> At the same time, Donin's realms of action and propaganda were always confined to Capetian France and possibly if the German Empire, realms in which there would be no important cases of educated Jews converting and remaining active as public intellectuals after the conversion as far as I know, until much later. But the cultural distance between Sefarad and Ashkenaz would be bridged only slightly after Donit by Pablo Cristiani, Paul Cristiani, the convert who became a Dominican and the Christian representative of the most famous of the medieval disputation, that of 1263 in Barcelona. Uh, Cristiani was from Montpellier, and his preaching activity emerged under the sponsorship of the church in Provence, Catalonia, and ultimately northern France too, as in the Second Disputation of Paris in 1269. Now, as the Hebrew account of the Barcelona Disputation by Nachmanides has it, Donin really was different from his successor, to whom we now briefly turn. It was in the same intellectual climate, and the Maimonidean controversy in particular, it was this same intellectual climate that provided the context for the case of Shaul of Montpellier, who was trained under Eliezer ben Emmanuel of Tarascon and possibly Yaakov ben Elia. In the early 1230s, as a, re a result of the wave of preaching by Ramon of Peñafort in Provence, Shaul converted to Christianity and became a Dominican friar taking the name Paul Christiani. He became a renowned itinerant preacher. He participated in public disputations. Now, let's take the famous Barcelona disputation as the, our case study. His main polemical point, Christiani's main polemical point in this disputation, was attempting to show that rabbinic Agadah re revealed the truth of Christianity. To this aim, he demonstrated competence on rabbinic auctoritates, notwithstanding Nachmanides attempt to downplay, at downplaying Christiani's knowledge as incorrect or unoriginal. Christiani's pro-Christian usage of rabbinic literature is precisely what his adversaries found most irritating. Yaakov ben Elia devotes the whole first third of his long letter to Christiani to defending against Christiani's allegations Jewish, Jewish interpretations of difficult rabbinic homilies, objecting that Talmudic Agadot are the kind of easily accessible material that every religion must commit to writing for the purposes of preaching to the unsophisticated masses who are incapable of understanding higher religious truths in their purer intellectual form. Either way, Christiani demonstrated not only an expertise in rabbinical materials, but also a willingness to use sources other than reason in order to, to polemicize against Judaism. In effect, differently from Donin, he did not deny the authoritativeness of the Talmud, but merely used it to Christian ends. Mm. Ursula Ragac noticed that Christiani's uh, criticism of some rabbinic material corresponds by and large to Donin's, notwithstanding their different agendas, general agendas. And I also think that Christiani, well, Christiani in the Barcelona Disputation states that Maimonides, I translate, had no equal among Jewish sages in the last 400 years. I think that he, in that this mention of four centuries is merely a repetition of the dating of the Talmud that Donin had stated in Paris according to the Paris manuscript of the Vicuach. And another possibly revealing hint is the high esteem with which Christiani quotes Maimonides as an auctoritas to make his own point about the mortality of the Messiah. And last, once again differently from Donin's preaching, Christiani's was strongly aimed at missionizing and converting. Yes, yet both Donin and Christiani, the latter in the Paris Disputation of 1269 at least, liken Jews to heretics, thus implicitly threatening them with persecution and death. Also, this threatening in the identification of Jews and heretics, like Donin's, might have been somewhat enhanced by the Jewish redactors of both the Vikuchim, the, Vikuchim, the Paris Vikuch and the Barcelona Vikuch. Uh, with the aim of showing both Donin and Christiani in the worst possible light as dangerous enemies of the Jews. A thorough reconsideration of all the ambiguous evidence available is therefore
or necessary in order to decide, for instance, whether Christiani was or had been a rationalist or an anti-rationalist, which is not clear at all from, for instance, from Yaakov ben Lia's Gerrit. Now, uh, by the way of conclusion, I turn very briefly to the last case, Manuforte of Trani. Uh, Manuforte of Trani was a convert from Apulia who was active from the late 1260s, in the late 1260s and early 1270s, in anti-Jewish polemics. We have a recent edition mentioned by, behind my, me, a recent Italian edition published in 1213 of the all of the otherwise very scanty archival evidence about the case of Manuforte, an edition by Cesare Colafemina which was edited posthumously by Maria Pina Mascolo. And we can see that uh, notwithstanding the, 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 the scantiness um, of this evidence, uh, uh, we can see that uh, Manuforte's agenda was actually very similar to that of Nicholas Donning. We discussed the, briefly the thing uh, with Nadia last year, remember. The socially stable and economically flourishing condition of Jewish communities in southern Italy under Frederick II, who, had died, in, who died in 1250, declined rapidly in the second half of the 13th century, a phenomenon to be observed all over Europe. In 1266, the Capetian Charles of Anjou, brother of Louis IX and Count of Provence and of Anjou and Maine since 1246, was consecrated as Rex Sicilie by Pope Clement IV, who, by the way, had been earlier Louis IX's personal secretary. So Charles, Charles I at the time, militarily defeated Frederick's son Manfred in Benevento in 1266, and the latter's nephew Conradin in Tagliacozzo in 1268, thus conquering full sovereignty over Frederick's former kingdom in southern Italy and Sicily alike. Now, let's formulate the working hypothesis that the political intellectual context within which Manuforte was operating was no longer that of Frederick's tolerance and, let's say, attempt at a convivencia, but rather one very similar, if not identical, with Louis IX's friends. What we get to know about Manuforte is first that on April the 1st, 1267, King Charles assigned him a yearly pension of six golden ounces from the income of Trani's dying plant. As a reward for having converted to Christianity and for being steady in his new religion and quite active in preaching it to his former co-religionists and in promoting their conversion too. Manuforta is mentioned only four times in archival evidence and uh, for, uh, is mentioned for the last time only four years later in June 1271 by a local officer, governmental officer in Trani, who certifies to have paid for that year the prescribed yearly amount of money to Manuforte. On May 8, 1270, King Charles mandates his police officers, justiziari, to get permission from the local prior of the Dominican friars or from the local warden of the Franciscan friars or from the priest in charge of the local diocese permission to search, confiscate and send to his court the books that some Jews are known to have with themselves. I am translating the Latin. And we are also told that Manuforte, the former Jew and former chief of the synagogue, had denounced this box as containing blasphemies against Jesus and Virgin Mary. 
Now, the titles of this box differ in one case in Call of Eminence edition of the sources. Uh, in the short notice before, the, well, they are called. There, there's, a sh uh, there's a short notice in Italian preceding the edition of the Latin, where the, the texts are called Talmud, Karbokt, et sedur. Whereas in the edition of the piece of evidence itself, the titles are Talmud, Kair Boet, and Sedur. I mean, not a big difference. It, it can, of course, uh, uh, depend on uh, an, a first mistaken uh, transcription of a, a more likely correct Karbokt, in my opinion. Also, there's the issue that Cesare never had the time to, to, to check, to double check his transcription of the sources in their kept in the archival, in the state archive in Naples, and Maria Pina uh, did the check for, after his passing away. But in any case, whatever the case, this corresponds in all details with the confiscation and the investigation of the Talmud in Louis IX's France. Also, the titles of the confiscated books appear in all the three manuscripts, or main manuscripts, of the Paris Latin Talmud dossier. Which includes, remember, uh, an anthology of the Talmudic passages called the Extractiones de Talmud, and an anthology of passages from liturgical hymns called Liber Krubot. As for the Sedur, the third part of uh, uh, Manufortes' accusations, I explain it as a reference to the Birkat Aminim, which is included in Donin's article, in Donin's charges against the Talmud, as it is in the text of the Shmon Esre, but uh, is only mentioned and not incorporated as text in the Bavli in its present textual form. One word about the Karbokt from Wout van Beckum's article. Wout defines the title Karbokt, uh, sorry, Krubot, from the, the Latin man, Paris manuscript. He defines it as exceptional, that's his own word. Because, given the character and the content of that part of the Paris Latin Talmud manuscript, bearing this title, there can be little doubt that the, the editor or the editors of the Latin Talmud mistook the name of a section of a liturgical sequence, I mean, Krovot as the name of a liturgical literary genre, as the title of an already existing compilation, this is Vouts. That is, the title of a whole book in its own right, Liber Krubot. The fact that the same name, turned into a title, appears in the sources about Manuforte, can be considered, from a text-critical perspective, as a coincidence in an indicative error. The title is mistaken. It appears in the Paris Latin Talmud dossier. It also appears 30 years later in a totally different context in southern Italy, in Apulia. Therefore, the Apulian evidence should depend, must depend, philologically, on the Parisian evidence, on the Latin Talmud material. So, if this is the case, it proves that Manuforte was dealing with the same polemics and textual evidence as Donin and the Dominicans in Paris around 1240. Further, there are other similarities between the condition of the Jews in France in the <coughs> 1230s and 1240s and in the new Angevin Apulia in the 1270s. In both cases, there, were great, there was great financial pressure on Jewish communities through both regular yearly taxation, systematic extortion, and arbitrary detention, detention, sorry, arbitrary detention to seize only after bail. In December 1273, the Jews of Apulia appealed to King Charles, who mandated the justiciari, the, the, the police commissioner, the police commissioner of the province of Bari, to prevent the Archbishop and his Curia from doing so, and to reaffirm the status of the Jews as Camere Nostre Servi. That's in the piece of evidence evident once again by Cesare Colofemina, which is a major element of continuity be between uh, the earlier um, Hohenstaufen, imperial administration of Apulia, and the new Angevin one. 
In 1269-1270, the taxation upon the Jews in Apulia was reduced in several towns, uh, not just in Apulia, even in Cosenza, so all over the kingdom of Sicily. Um, and this, we are told that this happened because Jewish households had grown smaller and smaller in time, a fact that, in my opinion, is best explained by tax cuts in favor of Jews who converted to Christianity. As happened, for instance, again in 1294, to the advantage of several dozens of Jews in the whole kingdom from Naples to Taranto. And this very same policy, uh, policy I learned from an article of, of, uh, Nadia, uh, of Nadia's from California Italian Studies of 12, uh, eight years ago, that this very same policy had already been enforced earlier on the Jews of France by Louis IX. The only other occurrence of Manuforte in the sources is in another document from 1270, here, Manuforte is told to have stated that many converts from Judaism were behaving again as Jews and had gone into hiding in several regions of the kingdom. Manuforte is also given instruction, provisio, to that these crypto Jews are forced to observe their new religion quod compellantur ad servandam fidem Christianam, it is therefore likely that by converting to Christianity, Manuforte had not only earned the king's year the pension, but also a role of responsibility as a public officer. And I conclude by returning to Yossi Schwarz's distinction be between communities of knowledge and communities of discourse. Reconstructing the biographies and the contexts, contexts both material and intellectual, of Donin, Cristiani, and Manuforte, entails an articulate effort of slaloming <laughs> between documentary, literary, direct and indirect evidence, both in Latin and in Hebrew. And it is hard, at least it's hard for me, to establish whether our three converts and polemicists belonged to one same community of knowledge. As I have tried to argue, there is a quite clear distinction between the intellectual lore of one Donin and one Cristiani. Still, they were both well-versed in rabbinic literature, and both their intellectual polemics against their former religion were rooted, if through different channels, in the Maimonidean Kerel of the 1230s and in the Aristotelian rationalist attack against tradition as the only legitimate source for truth. As for the relationship between Donin's polemics and Manufortes, Though evidence about the latter is even scantier than about Donin, it seems to me that both their anti-rabbinical equipment and their community of discourse were one and the same, though at a distance of 30 years and of thousands of miles. Also, one and the same were the royal policies about the Jews and the social, political and financial space granted to the Jews in Louis IX's France and in Charles I's Sicily, that is, present-day southern Italy at large. The relationship between medieval anti-rabbinic polemics by converts from Judaism and modern anti-rabbinic polemics by Christian Hebraists of the modern age, both Protestant and Catholic, I'm thinking for Protestants to, to of, I'm thinking of uh, Johann uh, Andreas Eisenmenger, for instance, and, and on the Catholic side, to, uh, I'm thinking of uh, late 19th century authors such as uh, August Rohling and uh, Justinus Pranaitis. And the link that possibly connects late medieval polemics to this modern and almost contemporary polemics, to my knowledge, uh, to my knowledge is still an untrodden path for research. So there's a lot still to be done. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Piero, Thank for you a uh, very um, articulate and I think also masterful slalom. Um, the floor is open for questions, comments, remarks. Please. Danny. Uh, short question, short comment and long question. Uh, uh, in terms of blood libel and attack on the Talmud, if I'm not mistaken, the very end of Yitzhakon Yashan has two short passages on the exact same thing. It's interesting that he ends the book by those two subjects. 
So it doesn't have anything to do with, might necessarily, not necessarily have anything to do with donating, but might be connected to this issue of whether the Jews at least perceive uh, blood libel and public attack in the same way. The larger question is in terms of, you mentioned in passing sort of the conversionary campaign, and of course you spoke about converts, and as you know, one of the major issues is what, what was the purpose of these disputations and whether or not they had conversionary uh, uh, motives. I was wondering if you could address that question, what's your view of what, the conversionary aspects of the public disputations? Uh, I, I just want to understand some terms. We were you talking to about the uh, one one one? No, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna answer that. As far as I know, it was identified as generally um, liturgical liturgical texts, Hebrew liturgical texts. Uh, you mean the Krobot the Krobot? Uh, sorry, yes. uh, are you uh, identifying this term as referring to a specific book called Krova or Krobot? Mm. This is, this is a very important question because if there is such a such a book, then it's very interesting to know if it wasn't when it was. So I'm going to try to answer. Uh, may I try to answer first uh, to, to Nadia? It's, it's kind of shorter. Um, I, I followed in, in, in my. I, I based my reconstruction of the issue on Wout van Beckham's uh, commentary comments on 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 the Krubot. So the Krubot, as all the, of the Latin Talmud dossier, is still unpublished. That is going to be pu published very soon, hopefully. And this forthcoming miscellany where uh, my new critical edition of Donin's Articuli is appearing and also Gerge Hasselhoff's edition of the, the, the whole anthology of the Liber Krubot from the um, Paris, uh, Girona and Carpentra manuscripts. Uh, Wout says that, in his opinion, Krubot was the Latin rendition of a title that was mistakenly perceived as the title of a book. Whereas, it, in all likelihood, it had been, as it is now, only the title of a section of a Sidur or of a Machazor. So, um, it was uh, like created into a book by uh, one or more not so competent editors, redactors of the uh, Hebrew and Aramaic materials translated into Latin for the issue. And that so you're suggesting it's an anthology of yes, it, it definitely is. I have gone through uh, Gerge. I also have to thank Gerge for <coughs> allowing me to to go through his uh, edition, still unpublished edition, soon to be published edition of the Krubot in the Latin dossier, and it is an anthology of passages, short passages taken from the Agada, and we know that the genre of the uh, Krubot is uh, deeply rooted in, in Agadic traditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the passages that, that are taken from the Krubot are passages of, of the usual kind that we know from the Latin Talmud. Mm -hmm. They are mm, against the Goyim, mm -hmm. meaning the Christians. They are irrational, they are ridiculous, they represent God uh, in uh, ridiculously, with ridiculously humanized features and stuff. The, the, the polemical r rubrics are exactly the same mm -hmm. as with the rest. But the title was perceived as the title of a specific book, definitely. Uh, I think Wout's reasoning uh, is very persuasive in the respect, and I, given that this is a mistake, it's of course not precisely a textual uh, error in transmission, an error in textual transmission, as it is an error in cultural transmission at large, but it is an error notwithstanding, and if there is a coincidence in an error, and this is a very significant error, then there is dependence, historical dependence mm -hmm. between the two contexts. Mm -hmm. That's why I allow myself to, to form the hypothesis that actually, as you told time, me last year... This term was first time uh, identified by Isidore Leub when he uh, discussed the uh, Talmud trial. And then all sorts of people wondered what it was and what it was not. And what you are uh, discussing here is a, a Christian Latin compilation of all sorts of passages taken from uh, Rasha, Gada, prayer books. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Gotcha. Okay. And can, thank you very can much. Can I dovetail on that for a moment? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dan. Um, I think that they're a long, a long time for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to answer? Okay, so okay. answer him first. And I'm okay. uh, Danny, thank you for for reminding me of the, the Nizakon Yashan. I think I have a note about that in, in an earlier version of my paper. Uh, but thank you very much, because I had forgotten this case. Uh, just a footnote to your, to your observation. There's, there's also mention of the blood libel uh, in the um, mention in the in the Sefer Yosef Mekane, mm -hmm. there is one mention of in, in secondary literature. Of course, I have all the evidence uh, filed. And it's mentioned that with, uh, with reference to, to a, a scholar in Paris, and this reference has been in, in, in secondary literature has been connected, uh, if only speculatively, to Donin. Uh, it's a very interesting um, thing. My uh, disciple, about whom we were talking earlier, Luca Benotti, who produced this critical edition, commented edition of the Sefer Yosef Mekane for his dissertation, has a very good footnote about that. So you will see it. Um, but um, in, in his opinion, and in my opinion too, there is no way to positively connect it with Donin. With the per Dominic person, that's why I skipped about it. Also, the Dominican Thomas of Cantempre, who was a contemporary, I mean, he was younger during the Paris uh, trial. He was a Dominican, and in the twelve, in the early twelve sixties, he wrote his mag magnum opus called the, the Bonum Universale de Proprietatibus Apum which is a very important uh, collection of evidence for the aftermath of the disputation or whatever it was of 1240. There too there is a mention of the blood libel and there too, there, in my opinion, there's no positive way to connect it safely with Donin's character. Um, I would say that there is <laughs> If, uh, definitely, the, the blood libel as such was part of, uh, of the set of topics that were being discussed in the community of discourse that I was trying, following Yossi's path to footsteps, to define for Paris in the 1240s, 50s, and 60s. It's not mentioned in our literature. And now to come to, to, to your questions directly, to your question about whether this uh, disputation literary genre had or uh, a stronger or less strong aspect of uh, a conversionary aim. It was, more, it was less about the literature and more about the events. Mm. Say it again, you mean that? You said, did the literature have conversionary? Yes. And I was saying, I wasn't asking about the literature, I was asking about the events themselves. Uh -huh. the, public, the fact that yes. Christians um, initiated public disputations about with Jews, whether or not that was part of a larger Christian missionary campaign against the Jews, or had other motives, as some people, including at this table, have suggested. The Latin evidence, I, I'm talking about sources, because I'm not trained as an historian, I'm trained as a uh, as textual scholar, so <laughs> if I don't have sources, I feel unsafe. <laughs> I play the historian, but I try to. So the Latin evidence, I'm thinking of uh, Barcelona and uh, of Paris. Uh, I, I don't think it can be connected to, to an already existing missionary effort. As much as it is on, uh, it can be connected, I mean it's, the, the Latin Talmud is, uh, is research literature. It represents a huge intellectual effort to understand a whole lore 
that was previously unknown or known only in an indirect form, for instance, through Peter or venerables, possible sources, indirect sources about uh, Gadot. New textual evidence that is being taken to, to the, the attention of Christian authorities, both secular and, uh, and ecclesiastic, by converts that are acting for reasons that are, uh, first and foremost, acting for reasons of inner Jewish polemics. Rationalist criticism of uh, rabbinic tradition. I, I, I think that the agenda, the Donin's agenda, by and large, was not that different from Uriel da Costa's or uh, or even Spinoza's. After all, of course, the the historical consequences and the sociological conclusions one can derive from their different biographical trajectories are very different. In the main, when when da, da Costa writes his huge examen uh, the traditiones fariseas, he is not that distant from Donin's criticism of, of the same tradition, of rabbinical tradition. Um, and it would be interesting to see whether the the, the, the textual evidence on which uh, Donin's accusations and da Costa's criticism are based are the same. Um, as for uh, Hebrew sources, Hebrew sources that are uh, later, for instance, in the case of Paris, there is scarcely any doubt that the Vikuach is a, a, a later piece of literature that probably I'm growing increasingly convinced of, uh, of uh, Heim's hypothesis, uh, or should I say contention, that the, the, an actual trial actually never took place or we cannot be that assured that it took place as it is described with the court in the, cor in the, in the, the gardens of the Louvre, uh, the, 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 the Queen Mother preceding the court, um, chairing the court. Uh, we cannot think that. The, 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 the Vikuach is basically a piece of literature that is meant for anti-missionizing purposes. It is an ontology of passages that grows across its textual transmission and the Oxford manuscript, which is from the second half of the 17th century, is actually more or less twice the size of the Paris manuscript. The, the Vikuach in the Oxford manuscript, let me make myself clear, sorry. The Vikuach in the, in the Oxford manuscript, second half of the 17th century, is twice the size of the Vikuach in the Moscow and, uh, and in the Paris manuscript. The Paris manuscript being uh, from the second half of the 13th century, in any case. So this is literature that uh, was meant from the very beginning, I think, as uh, um, to provide a tool for counter-argumentation against Christian preachers. So paradoxically, the Latin evidence about these disputations is more of, an, uh, of a documentary <coughs> nature. More. Not of a document, a precise of the documentary nature, but more of the documentary nature, way more than the Hebrew evidence is. And the Hebrew evidence, certainly, in my pretentious opinion, <laughs> was meant to counter Christian missionizing. That's why these texts grow quantitatively throughout th through time. And that's also why. The Vikuach, even in its older extant witnesses from the 13th century, that is the Paris manuscript and the Hamburg manuscript, the Vikuach shows a very scarce overlap in the sources, the Talmudic sources, that are discussed. In, I mean, the, the overlap in, in the sources discussed between the Latin Talmud dossier and the Vikuach Rabbeinu Yehiel is surprisingly scanty. It's like 20% of the, of the whole. I have uh, the precise percent in the computation. Articles, those are yes. Articles. The 35 articles are uh, um, documented with uh, um, an excellent Latin translation of, the, of um, proof texts taken from the Talmud and in, from, from Rush's commentaries to the Talmud, and in one case, the Birkat Aminim from the liturgy. Mm -hmm. Talmudic passages are also discussed at length in the Vikuach. The overlap between the passages is surprisingly scanty. 
I can give you precise uh, the, the precise quantity of the passages that are discussed. I think I have a maybe I possibly have a graph about that in, in one of the articles that I've published over the years on this topic. But this, in my opinion, this means that uh, I mean Donin's Donin's article, which I have just read again and again because I edited them anew. Um, they are very precisely documented. The, 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 the accusations are very well rooted in the text. It's anthologized. Whereas the, the discussion in the Vikur is much more... Uh, uh, it is less formal and m much more of a literary nature. And it ultimately serves uh, Jewish apologetics against Christian missionizing. So I, I, I wonder whether this was this was certainly not a satisfactory answer, but an attempt at an answer it certainly was in my intention. Thank you. May I? You're welcome. Um, okay, so uh, I want to ask you about um, if I understood you correctly, you're suggesting that Manuforti di Trani is basically following a tradition and literary tradition that he receives from textual evidence that emanates from the previous actions of um, of Nicolaus Don, right? This is part of your argumentation. What I, what I think may also um, work as proof for that, or as uh, from your argumentation itself, is the existence of passages from Talmud, Sidur, and Korvot. Um, the fact that Kurvot come separately from Sidur uh, is interesting because we also know that these are two separate dossiers, the two separate books. No Machzor contains a Sidur and no Sidur contains a Machzor, and the Kurvot are in the Machzor. That's an important the point that they have to add, definitely. And that's Thank in, you very that, much. That's in the Sidur. Uh, so so the Kurvot are, two, are in the Machzor and not in the Sidur. are always in the Machzor. They're part of the liturgy, the special liturgy for special Shabbatot, especially Yamim Tov, and the Yamim Tovim. They are not part of the Sidur. Sidur is the everyday prayer. Now, when Donin attacks the Sidur, and we have we don't. We don't have. Uh, uh, Donin focuses on Birkat Aminim. Um, I would also suggest that you should look beyond Birkat Aminim, as you s suggested that there is not necessarily an overlap, mm -hmm. um, because Sidur, especially in the 12th, late 12th and 13th century, has more extracts of anti-Christian um, manifestations, very similar in nature to the ones you mentioned in Manufotis. Uh, um, kind of letter of uh, what he wants confiscate, right? Uh, attacks on the Virgin Mary and on Jesus. And I'm suggesting specifically uh, evidence that the late Israel Tashma worked on in his uh, ideas about the Ashkenazi Sidur. He has uh, amazing evidence from uh, the Corpus Christi 133 manuscript uh, uh, that is a northern French Sidur which overlaps geographically with what N Nicolas Donin would have been familiar with, more or less from the same time frame. And there you have very um, explicit language uh, in Alenu le Shabach, which is a, 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 a prayer that is being crystallized more or less at the same time and is novel. And that's interesting. It's novel, it's based on Talmudic extracts, and it has very powerful anti-Christian language uh, targeting both Jesus and the Virgin Mary, which are part of what Manuforte is, is kind of trying to pitch. Um, I, I, I'll just, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read just an extract. Which is the standard prayer, and then it goes on to say, "Shehem mitpalelim lehevel varik mitpalelim leel lo yoshia adam efer dam mara basar srucha rima," which is a uh, 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 a play on, on the letters of Mary. Tmeim tmeot menafim menafot metim be'avonam u'nemekim berisham beluye afar kuvei rima. Also a play on the on the letters of Mary. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. Varik, No, Varik is also the, the acronym for 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 Yeshua, for, for Yeshua. So so it's it's 
And what, what is, I think, compelling about this bit of evidence is that it's novel, it's northern French, definitely, yes, and it, it comes from more or less the same kind of ballpark where Donin is trying to establish his criticism, and you can, if you, if you suggest that is what is going on in the Sidur, not necessarily only Birkat Aminim, which is, is older, uh, then you have, I think, a, a, a good, powerful argumentation also for Manufo. Thank you very, thank you so much for this who, important. Who this? For, uh, Tashma, Tashma, Tashma. 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 He has a whole chapter on. Yeah. He has a chapter on Aleinu Lishabach and how Aleinu Lishabach serves as a platform for anti Christian uh, um, you know, ranting of this nature. Uh, hmm? Yes. 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 But that's 13.89. Later. Thank you so much. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Pond, I really like the um, distinction between the networks of uh, knowledge and the networks of discourse. And, uh, I it's not mine, it's the yeah, right. There is a, a book, I don't remember the author, uh, discussing uh, networks of philosophers, and I think the model there is. Um, very, very interesting. It doesn't make this distinction, but it does show that you can um, you can show the connections between people from different places and different times and how they create a network. So that might add to the model. Thank you very much. Um, if I'll you happen to remember the, the, the book, uh, that'd be very useful. I have the book on my shelf. I know. It's a fantastic. from Harvard who spent 20 years yeah. developing these. Yeah. Uh, a very it's thick. a very thick book, yeah. and now I, I can't remember his, uh, <laughs> his name either. It's giving me occasion to, to, to drop by your office uh, once again. Yeah. <laughs> Good pleasure. I think uh, also John Tolan, uh, uh, in his early book on Peter Alfonsi, uh, actually tried to map. The, the, the network of his intellectual connection all over Europe, from Sfarat to, 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 to the British Isle. Almost uh, uh, the yes. same way of demonstrating mm -hmm. Good, that's going to be a very useful way of deepening the argument. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, you know, just a very short remark and then, and then a, a, a long question as usual in my case, sorry. <laughs> Uh, regarding just the short remark, uh, don't forget that <coughs> Uriel da Costa examination, he claimed that somewhere, somewhere in the world there were Jews who they behaved like Sadducees. By that he was meaning to the Karaite perhaps. And this is a major difference in terms of the utterance of both authors even though they, both of them, they put into serious question the reliability of the oral law, okay? But then now, <coughs> my question. You, you put the, in a very interesting way the, the arguments and the life of these converts and the political uh, framework. And perhaps, but perhaps I am completely wrong. We have to to take more into consideration a kind of, uh, I will say, mis missing link, although it is implicitly, you, you, you spoke about that, the Dominicans and the Franciscans. You mentioned that Donin, according to the Hebrew, he was related particularly to the Franciscans and not to the Dominicans. This is not, of course, the case of uh, of Christianity, and uh, then my question is: On the one hand, if if you have something to say about a Manu Forte, whether he was more attracted by Franciscans than by the Dominican, and and lastly, the Angevin uh, tradition in terms of religiosity, of course, they supported the, the Dominican orders, but uh, we know things among others to Jacques Le Goff biography on Saint Louis, that he was particularly fond and his court to the Franciscan way of conceiving Christianity. 
And then should we see her perhaps a kind of Angevin Franciscan anti-Jewish link altogether, uh, which is perhaps different from a, I will say, a, a, a Dominican, uh, let's say, non-Angevinian, uh, more pro, uh, yeah, uh, link. Yeah, two two different uh, theological political avenues. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Claude. Thank, uh, thanks very much for that. I, I mean, th this, I, I knew that coming here was a, a big challenge for me, but also an immense pleasure and an immense enrichment for my, for my work. So thank you, you guys, all very, very much. Um, Manuforte first. Um, I have discussed all of the evidence that we have, I have presented all of the evidence that uh, we have about Manuforte. It's basically nothing. So if we are to, inf we can only infer from the uh, general context of religious history in southern Italy in the 13th century, whether it was more influenced, more connected to a Franciscan tradition of preaching uh, uh, or to a Dominican tradition. By the way, I have to admit that I am not, I would not be capable of answering a question about what the differences were between such an early preaching, a missionizing, missionary preaching towards the Jews by the Dominicans and by the Franciscans. I'm sure there are specialists that can answer such a question. But as for the evidence, there's no way to connect Manuforte specifically to a, a Franciscan rather than to a Dominican context. Uh, we're about uh, uh, a possibly more Franciscan-oriented context, general context, in Angevin, southern Italy, along with Capetian, northern France. Uh, this is a, a very interesting, well, I, I take it as a hypothesis because I read um, the Goff's biography of Louis IX when I was at the, ver at the very early stage of my research on the Vicuach. I'm talking of 20 years ago. And um, I didn't find it very useful at the time. So now the time has come to read it again, <laughs> definitely. Um, I hope to find a further path uh, in, in, in this direction because this would uh, be a further hint to the ho hopefully the validity of my connection between uh, Louis the Ninth and Charles the First and their politics towards the Jews, the, the definition of the space of the Jews in Capetian France and in Angevin Sicily and Apulia, that would uh, strengthen my, my main point. Yes. I take it as a suggestion, not as a question, so forgive me if I don't answer. Thank you, but again. I'd like to sort of follow on from what uh, Dov was, was uh, uh, saying, but also continue your, your line of thought. Because I, I, well, I think a very interesting book uh, appeared a few years ago by uh, a man called, by a scholar called Robin Vosse, who wrote about the uh, Dominicans in the uh, in the uh, uh, Crown of Aragon, mm -hmm. and uh, he made a methodological remark at the beginning, which I think is really really uh, uh, important, and I think informs much of what has been written in. Uh, uh, in, in, in scholarship, and he, he basically said that uh, uh, we tend to forget that in the 13th century, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, yeah, he doesn't say this exactly, uh, that we tend to forget that in the 13th century these were new orders, mm -hmm. and we tend to, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and, and we tend to uh, uh, read back into their history, right, from, uh, or scholars have tended to read back into their, into their history what they were in the 16th, uh, 15th and 16th centuries when they were very far more active in uh, uh, mission, particularly after the discovery of uh, uh, the re America. discovery, rediscovery of the or whatever of the of the uh, uh, Americas, and then we read back into their because they were doing that in the 16th century. Therefore, they must have been doing that in the 
in the 13th century uh, as well when they were mm. when they were found. And I think that's a, that's an incredibly important uh, methodological remark and something that uh, I've at least have taken into account when I've been. Uh, uh, and I think that you're right in the sense that. Uh, yeah, we, we, the Dominicans and Franciscans uh, seem to have had already from the beginning uh, uh, separate paths, but we seem, tend to forget that in the middle of the, well, the time we're talking about, in the middle of the 13th century, the, 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 Francis, the Franciscans are, are tearing themselves apart yes. as to what they themselves, uh, uh, what path they're, they're, supposed, they're supposed to be uh, uh, following. Right, the, Domin the Dominicans seem to be, and again, here we have to, uh, 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 within the Dominicans themselves, there seems to be disagreement as to also what path uh, they, they uh, uh, should be following and where they should put the emphasis. And what Robin Vossa shows very, which is really nice, he goes into the archives, at least the archives that survive, right, and tries to say, okay, what were they spending their money on? Okay, so for all these activities, you need you need uh, uh, money. Okay, you need. It's all very nice to talk about uh, mission and uh, setting up of language schools and and, and and everything else, but you need you need to have uh, uh, funding. And he goes and looks at and tries to trace right from within the archives what the uh, uh, sources of funding. And he discovers that perhaps not surprisingly, that there's that you cannot show that there that there was consistent effort at mission to the uh, uh, Jews right, or to the Muslims in that period. Okay, that's not to say that there wasn't, it's not to say that there wasn't uh, uh, afterwards that it, or that didn't develop as one of their main, as one of the mainstays of their uh, activities right? and he's focused on the Dominicans but it's, if you look at the, uh, 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 what they were spending their money on and what activities were important, the, there's just no evidence or not enough evidence at least to say that this was one of the main, uh, uh, and I think then if you go back to the text and look at it within, look at, as you did, right, and look at it within that uh, broader uh, context, what's happening there becomes much more complex. Sorry, but at, uh, at the same time, as we have not only go, go, go from 20 years ago, but others which, which uh, for instance, uh, demonstrated the Franciscan influence on the construction of the Saint-Chapelle in France and the a, a image of the Christ uh, killed or crucified body by the Jews as a topos which was elaborated by Saint Louis himself through the Franciscans. My own guess, without making any generalization, is that we have two tendencies. The, the, the Franciscans seems to me they are living, uh, although an Augustinian politics, but still in it, it, it is, it, it, they were more, some of them more sensitive to the idea of conversion or, or, or nothing, or expulsion. Whether the, my, my own perception is a tendency, not a law, of the Dominicans is to try to find a more, uh, I would say, critical, but, but still, a, a way of conceiving a Jewish living within the, 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 the Christian uh, domains. And, and I, I, I believe that, that these ideas evolved during time, but, but you can see already mm -hmm. in the 13th century this kind of Judenheim and Jews and heretics which you can somehow reconcile them vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 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 a Franciscan and, and, and a Dominican tradition. Uh, uh, there's, um, if I can add one thing, it, it dawned on me that in the, the list of the members of the jury that uh, examined the Talmud for the second time under Innocent IV, uh, uh, coming to the, the, the so-called sentence, sentence of Odo Chateauroux in 1248, if I am not mistaken, includes both Franciscan intellectuals and Dominican intellectuals. So, uh, in, in, the, in the parish, in the Paris uh, mm -hmm. affair, the two mendicant authors seem to have uh, gone on cooperating on, yes, one, sir, on the same level, at mm -hmm. least and, until the end of it. Mm. Which is another thing that must be added to the, to the picture. But the list, of course, also well, includes. Sometimes, but just in terms of the fact that I'm not it's possible that, that people were reading the 16th, 15th century into the, the 13th, but I think that part of the narrative of 
Dominican and Franciscan conversionary efforts also comes from contemporary Jewish documents. It's not only from later historical, but what the Jews were saying. And it's obvious the Jews perceived I mean, the, the Jews had no access to the to the books of the Dominican monasteries. They didn't know how much they really were spending on food and, and whatever. But they did know that when they met these people on the street, that there's a, that they had problems. Yeah, except for the Kanes, it says it very, very explicitly. Yeah, so, left so that so at least it's a Jewish perception that there was a conversionary campaign. Whether or not there was. I don't know, but I know the Jews thought there were, and I don't, and I think the Jews also felt threatened by this conversionary campaign at the time. So, uh, yeah, they, they, you know, it just like we always judge. If you read the Israeli press, the only thing that's mentioned, the only thing that foreign press does is talk about Israel, right? Because that's what is of interest. Uh, if there's a, and anybody who dies who's Jewish gets into the Israeli press, and you read the foreign press, you would know he's Jewish, right? So it's a very self-centered view, but that's the view that the Jews have. Actually, the, the evidence before uh, Nadia, yeah. the, I was thinking of the evidence about Manuforte. We had sources that actually m mentioned very clearly that Manuforte was uh, leading a campaign, was the, the, the response, was in charge of a campaign of missionizing the Jews. The Jews. Mm -hmm. A campaign that was successful, as far as we can say, because the, those who converted uh, had tax cuts to the point that the number, the number of the, com the, the, the numbers of the, 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 the Jewish households was rapidly decreasing. Therefore, meaning less income for for the secular authorities. Can you and say we're talking about small numbers because you you, only, you know only too well that Italian commu communities on, on the Italian territory have always been very very small, but very active but very small. Can you say not, sorry, not Nadia, you were uh, two comments. Uh, one about well, actually it is my interpretation, so I am very careful about this about the evidence uh, of uh, Abraham Abulafia regarding the conversions in his period, which is the period of Monforte. I'm not talking about the later conversions at the end of the 13th century. That is a Hebrew source. If you are interested, I can send you my Hebrew article on this. Uh, on this. But this is beside the There is one more I am definitely extremely interested. Thank okay. you very much, Nadi. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, and sorry for missing it myself. No, no, I, I'm sending you, no worry. <laughs> and, um, other observation is uh, one of them is just a general one, the other one I'm quoting uh, Josef Schatzmiller regarding Angevin uh, policy. Uh, Schatzmiller points out at the inconsistency in Angevin policies regarding the Jews. And he gives quite a lot of examples, which is very interesting to see how on one hand they could be very rigid, very conversionist. On the other hand, well, I wouldn't say tolerance, but I would say, okay, a kind of uh, let leave. Uh, and this is very interesting because it has some implications also for the Muslim situation in Southern uh -huh. Europe. Uh, now the other uh, the other side of this point, or this point. Uh, sorry if I interrupt you, Nadia. Where, but can, can you be so kind as to remind me or tell me actually yes. where did Schatzmiller write yes, this? Yes. Yes. Thank so, you very much. So it is the um, uh, 50th anniversary of the Italia Judaica. Judaica ah yes, Judaica. yes, yes. Okay, okay yes. Uh, and yes, well, the other thing I wanted to point out, which is really very much in tune with what uh, Schatzmiller says, is the difference between the Angevin policies toward the Jews in Sicily itself, in the island of Sicily, and on the mainland in southern Italy. Because as far as we know, there are not that many documents, but there is no evidence of any attempt to convert Jews in Sicily. Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, in this period, of course, mm -hmm. later uh, Sicily is not more under the Vingo, but I'm talking about the uh, uh, 1260s, 1270s. And 70s, is because Vespers. after that, it's still in Vespers, yes. On the so. other hand, as, as we said, mm -hmm. even you have this quite massive uh, uh, conversion effort. So maybe uh, this man thought had a role in these things in southern Italy, 
because you know uh, Dominicans and Franciscans were present in uh, on the island and uh, on the mainland, just uh, just the same. So maybe the difference is really the presence of this personage who perhaps had access to the king, perhaps uh, suggested uh, looking into Jewish books and so on. I mean, it's just that so I have no evidence for this except for the difference. Okay, between. And of course, this is the question of the inconsistency that Schatzmiller emphasizes. So could the, the two aspects of your observation be related to one, to one another? I mean, Abulafia might have chosen Sicily as his place of, uh, of election for... Uh, I don't know, Abulafia uh, later comes to Sicily, Sorry, but he think? comes to Aragonese, Sicily. He, uh, he, uh, what he talks about the conversions is in, during his stay at Capua and uh, in Southern Italy. I'll send him an article, you'll see okay, the, where you. the quotations come from. Now, okay, thank you very much. I, I must say that it's my interpretation. Moshe uh, either disagrees with me. He thinks it means something else. But when I see Yotzem in a flag, I interpret it as dysfunction. So Yotzul et Tarbuta, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for excellent. Lecture. And Thank you. I, I would like just to follow uh, Dov Stuchinsky's uh, remark about the difference between Franciscan and Dominican. As far as I remember, southern France, the Kingdom of Napoli, it's the Dominicans were the uh, uh, top of the attack on Jews and Culvers, and not Franciscans. It's uh, Dominican Inquisitors that played the central role at that time. And uh, I think we should mention uh, the excellent article of uh, Joshua Starr, an old, a very old article, which I find until now I think it's the best one, about what happened uh, at that time in uh, Southern City. So, so it's not so easy to, to make this difference. You misunderstood me. Yeah? Yeah. I am not I am not uh, turning the Dominicans into uh, mm -hmm. Shalom Akshavri. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I am I, I am just just uh, saying that they are it seems to be a tendency again it's not a rule, a tendency, a tradi a different tradition to deal with. But is the place of the Jews within the mystical valley. This, this, this is my point. Not the, the, in terms of violence, but in terms of what to do with them. What is their place? This is my point. So this is another thing. Okay, thanks. And I have another question for you. It's not uh, directly uh, about uh, the subject here, but you use the Jacob uh, uh, Ben Eliyahu Garrett uh, letter to, uh, to Paul and I. Very interested to know your opinion about the disputation between uh, Stowe and Chazen about the conversion of uh, Jacob and I don't remember the distinction. I, I, I read the bibliography a long time ago. Uh -huh. I realized that we are dealing with a text that is uh, uh, as poorly edited as the Vikuach. Huh? And I want, it, it is my next, for, for my next life. And it's my, my research project. I, I, I need to provide a different edition from, we need a different edition from Kabax, which dates from the 1860s. Yes. I remember both um, Chazen's article and Kenneth's and Ken's, but I don't remember the topic. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> of course I have, um, okay. I have filed them in my, my archives, thereby giving myself an alibi, a reason to forget them. Sorry. I know Star's article is really very well documented, but there are some people who are disagreeing with Star about the role of the Dominicans. For instance, Benjamin Scherer, who was here, he thinks it was the Franciscans who were more involved in the conversions and so many things. So I can't judge between the two, but there are really different opinions. Short kind of philological question, given what Dov just said, and the fact that 
uh, as you say, the religious commitment of Bernie is uh, questionable, not only through his biography, but by um, observations um, or posthumous observations about his commitment uh, towards Christianity. Um, you draw a connection between him and um, Monforte. And if I, if members, memory serves, the last piece of information sta about him states that he was asked to deal, mm -hmm. so the phrase is compelantur ad, um, ad servandam fidem christiani, right? Really? So how, um, how certain are you that the notion of servare translates to conversion as such, or whether it's a sense of serving the Christian faith. No, I, I'm not sure convinced that it means uh, to, to, to practice Christianity. Well, are you? Let's, uh, let's go, yes. Let's go back to the, the uh, show. Well, so need it, they need to yeah. return to practice Christianity. Sure, but, but no, yeah. return to, to serve. Okay, return to servare. The question is whether servare really just means as such, just convert to Christianity, or practice Christianity as such, or whether they Next are su their thoughts uh, so so encouraged um, to occupy this space that is not quite, you know, not there, it's not there. Not quite. Here, I'm so sorry. You see, I even for, forgot to, to 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 copy the the, the precise date of the of, of this piece of archival evidence. Uh, I only took the year, and I didn't copy it. I didn't transcribe it in full. I'm sorry, but the, the question was about. Jews that had already converted and were behaving as crypto Jews and had gone, that's the interesting thing, they had gone into hiding in several parts of the kingdom. Which is easy because the, the kingdom was and huge and there are parts of territory, especially in Calabria near Cosenza and stuff that are totally out of control even for the Italian state today. <laughs> as we know only too well. Uh, therefore, they went into hiding, and Manforte is, uh, is mandated, is, is given provisio, which means that he has an authority to enforce this provision, quod compellantur ad servandam fidem Christianum, so to, to go on behaving like Christians. So, is this missionizing? Is this. Or, or my or my just question is really on the theological, mm. kind of the, the lexical. Uh, I think of, of, of servant. Is to serve the Christian faith? Does that just mean squarely? I think it, the, the, it, it would be more. Uh, might be mistaken, of course. I think it would be more correct to translate it as to keep mm -hmm. their new Christian faith practice. Feeding can be rendered with practice, I think, in several contexts. Here too, specifically. Thank you. Hello. So Hi, you are. my name is Olga Kirschman and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Bariland. It's a long time since I looked at medieval materials, so this question appears even general. Forgive me, but I'm still trying to understand the difference between, if you could just speak in general terms, between the 12th century and the 13th century. Between the 12th and the 13th? Right, what's, what's the shift? Do you feel like there's a shift or Oh my God! This is such a general question that I won't. I, I wouldn't dare to to to, to answer. I really don't know how to 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 where to start facing it from. I would say the general. Uh, and there, of course, I wouldn't also wouldn't dare to to answer in the presence of uh, of great experts in, in, in the field. But I, um, but I, I I'm gonna sure to tell you that I'm what, what I'm interested in is that there are more than the differences are the elements of continuity. And there is a, a part of my work has been and I've already published about it is to reconstruct what in Donin's polemics against the uh, rabbinic Judaism and Talmudic lore comes from earlier sources. Sources that belong to the 12th century that start from from the early 12th century with Peter Alphonse's work. Mm -hmm. So what I see are interesting elements of continuity in an uh, inner discourse within a possibly definable discourse community 
of former Jews that became converts to Christianity and uh, assumed a role and possibly pensions as public critics of Judaism. I, I'm interested in seeing the, the, the elements that are the, the, the sources on which Donin might have built, on which he may have dealt in order to construct, in order to, to, to articulate his pretty articulate strategy of attack against one specific aspect of the, of the Judaism of his time and, and place. So for me, it's not about differences, it's about uh, similarities. But this is. This is not even an attempt at answer, I'm sorry. I think, yeah, yeah. one more. Yeah, yeah. You want me to? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Just to say that uh, uh, probably a generation ago there was this uh, very famous uh, discussion of, uh, between uh, Funkenstein and then uh, Jeremy Coven. Funkenstein saw the 12th century as the, the watershed between, between uh, what was before the acceptance of the Jews, and then in the 12th century, the, the Christians discovered the Talmud and so on, and everything changes. While well, Jeremy Cohen took it, third, uh, took it forward to the to the 13th century. century and put uh, the blame on the Franciscans and the, the, the Dominicans and then on the Vendicans and so on, uh, which Funkenstein didn't like very much because I had him talking about. It. So this is, I mean, probably the seminal, uh, the seminal works that uh, dealt with this uh, question. But I personally, I prefer much better the, the way of looking for continuities and not looking at the century as something like you know, something that changes very, very abruptly because the year twelve thousand. It starts now, 12,001. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it's much more fruitful to look, as you do, uh, for the for the continu continuities and, and the and the long threads of uh, of mm -hmm. knowledge that goes from one generation to the other. It, it is true. So, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. But, um, if, the, if we can find a, a, a watershed, uh, it, it's probably precisely in the, in the Latin Talmud. Mm -hmm. And the activity around the translation of parts of the, tal which, uh, of the Talmud into Latin. Mm -hmm. Because that's a moment where, uh, the, where knowledge of uh, rabbinic lore in Christian, within Christian societies actually changes. Earlier, what we know about the Talmud is scant. Really scanty. There is what, what is what, yes, the, there, there's a good stuff in Peter Alphonse, yeah. but Peter the Venerable depends on, um, yes, it's. On Peter Alphonse? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if we are to find watersheds and moments, historical moments, circumscribed, chronologically circumscribed moments where we can talk of a, a before and an after. I think the translation of the Talmud into Latin, the, the anthologization of the, Latin, uh, the Talmud into Latin was that moment. Much more than the, the trial of 1240 itself, provided that there ever was one. Okay. But the trial is dependent from yes. the translation. Yes. So it's the right If there was a, 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 I, I, I basically agree, now, now I agree with Chaim in thinking that there was a, an, an investigation. Shall we say an inquisition? But not a proper trial after all. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I want to thank Piero very much. Thank you.